you are lucky enough to be in the great state of New Mexico, the city of Albuquerque, you are in for a real treat if you like immersive opera. One of the performers, Madison Marie McIntosh, is going to be our guest today. She will not only sing for us, but she's going to share with us what it's like to be an opera singer. You know, Madison is a mezzo-soprano, and we had her as a guest over a year ago, and we're so happy to have her for a return engagement. everyone. Hope you've been having a wonderfully creative week. I'm Ron Jones, and we celebrate what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice so you can learn and be motivated by their life's experiences. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to Thought Road Podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we focus on sharing with everyone how they can think, be, and live more creatively. Okay, Angie, why don't you tell us a little bit more about our fabulous guest today? Sure. Today, we are going to be speaking with opera singer Madison Marie McIntosh. And she's even going to sing for us today. Yeah, that's going to be great. Yeah. I hope people check out her on social media. We have links for her on the show guest tab on the Thought Row podcast website. Yeah. And you'll have a chance to see some of the costumes that she wears. And in this particular opera, it's quite a surprise. Yes, it is. But it would make sense if you could share an opera quote, and I suspect you have one in the wings. I do, and here it is. An opera begins long before the curtain goes up, and it ends long after it has come down. It starts in my imagination, it becomes my life, and it stays part of my life long after I left the opera house. And this quote is by Maria Callas. Well, you went to the pinnacle of <laughs> opera with that yeah, quote I did. I... from one of the all-time greats, although I kind of like Pavarotti personally. You know, there's so many, and but this one just really stood out because of all the preparation. I think people that are in opera, they have to do before, during, and after, and as well as the emotionalness of, of being in an opera, I think. Oh, yeah. It's a, a lot, lot of, of preparation emotional emotionally. Preparation. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Oh, I think you picked an excellent quote. But how about let's start our interview with Madison. This is going to be a good one. Sounds good. Great to be speaking with you again, Madison. We're very excited. Yes. Hi, Madison. You're one of our favorite opera singers, and we're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you very much, Rod and Dingy. It's great to chat with you today. You know, before we discuss your career, but actually right now, where are you speaking with us from? I know you're not in your usual residence where you normally talk to us. Where are you right now? I'm actually in New Mexico to sing in the premiere of La Malinche, Traitor, Savior by composer Nathan Felix at the Albuquerque Museum. Oh, that's exciting. Well, we'll be How chatting fun. about that in a little bit. But before we get into your career as an opera singer, why don't you tell everyone where you're originally from and where you're living now? I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida, and then attended college in New York City. And I stayed in New York for the better part of the next few years to continue my training, to perform with opera companies in the city and the surrounding areas, and eventually to sign with management. Nowadays, of course, I go wherever the singing takes me. Early this spring, I sang Cinderella in Rossini's La Cenerentola, with Fargo Moorhead Opera in North Dakota. And then I rushed over to Connecticut in order to sing Julius Caesar with Connecticut Lyric Opera. After that, I worked with the brilliant Neil Cohen, one of your recent guests on Thought Row, mm-hmm. when he presented the concert premiere of Da Ponte in Accord, New York. And now, of course, I'm in Albuquerque. That's Exciting. so wonderful. You have had a busy schedule. You're a busy girl. <laughs> yes, I'm really, really grateful for that. You know, after all the lockdowns that we have, it must be so like exhilarating just to go and perform again and not have to deal with that. So, so happy for you that you're able to go perform again. Absolutely. Live performance is an experience that I learned not to take for granted. Of course, I was grateful for virtual performances in the meantime, uh-huh. but unfortunately, for whatever reason, I have one of those voices that do not come across very well in recordings. 
So uh, early last year, when I started to get into live performance again, I was just ecstatic. Oh, I bet. I bet you are. Well, there's no way somebody can listen to an opera on a mobile no, phone. it's different. Uh, yeah, on Zoom. I mean, Zoom, can you really do that? Yeah, even? it'd be that's even hard. worse. Yeah. That's so hard. I can understand that. And that's where a lot of talent complains when they have to do an audition for people. That's for right. People part. are auditioning now, like on Zoom or their little... I guess they pre-record it and send it, but they said it's very difficult to do this because it's new, you know. I everybody. think it's it's probably fair for us to ask right now because I'm assuming you weren't born singing an opera. What is the background? How did you decide that this is what you wanted to do in your life? Well, singing was, of course, something that I did for fun long before it involved into this burning passion that I have now. When my kindergarten class would sing our national anthem each morning, I would sing in my so-called opera voice, much to the consternation of my classmates. (laughs) And I would also embarrass my poor parents by singing very loudly in the congregation at church. Eventually, I auditioned for a school play in third grade. And the music director somehow contacted my parents and asked whether they knew that I had a voice for singing. And they replied, well, we knew she was loud. Um, <laughs> my parents were exceedingly supportive of me, though, and I started to take voice lessons about a year or two after that, by which time I knew that I wanted to be an opera singer. Wow. That's so impressive that you just, you. I think that life just presented the opportunities for you early on, really. Yeah, I was I mean, bitten by the bug at an early age. <laughs> so it, makes, it makes you wonder, I mean, when you talk to other people that are very talented, they often say that. that they just say, I think I was born to do this or mm-hmm. born to do that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you definitely are. Yeah, you're, you're at the right place at the right time. One of the things that we've always been impressed I've been very impressed by the yeah. way when we chat with you is how well you articulate your words, not like us from Southern in California. California, yeah. <laughs> is that part of your training? Did that come naturally to you? Do you do that for your singing? You're very articulate. You enunciate extremely well. Oh, thank you. I admit that I am a huge diction nerd. And yes, diction was a very important part of my training. In English diction class, we studied American Standard Pronunciation, British Received Pronunciation, and Mid-Atlantic. Oh my goodness. So you you studied all different styles of diction, not just to speak correctly and that's it. That's impressive. Wow. I really enjoyed learning about it. You know, uh, speaking of languages and diction, you know, in most operas, especially the really well-known ones, they're sung in Italian or German. How did you master the languages that you need to sing in if you don't speak them? We took diction classes as well as language classes in school and used the International Phonetic Alphabet to work on the diction of each language Mm -hmm. that we studied. I don't really know how to describe this, but I now find it amusing that I knew of that IPA before I knew of the beverage with the same initialism. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Huh, interesting, <laughs> interesting. Wow. The exciting thing for us, and because we've known you for such a long time, and we follow you on social media, like what, Instagram, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Yeah, and we're always excited that you share your performances and we get to hear your voice. Mm-hmm. You've been involved in many performances since we last spoke because we see your posts. Why don't you tell us about your favorite performance and why it was so important to you? Hmm. Well, it's always hard for me to pick a favorite, but because we were talking about Neil Cohen earlier, I'll mm-hmm. share a bit of information about him and his operatic musical, Da Ponte. Neil is a brilliant screenwriter, television writer, librettist, playwright, journalist, author, illustrator, and director. And his work is wonderfully witty. And in the case of period pieces such as Da Ponte, Historically informed, but never esoteric. Da Ponte is based on the fascinating life of Lorenzo da Ponte, who wrote the libretti of Mozart's most famous Italian operas. Oh, yeah. And it features music by Mozart and his contemporaries, as well as original music by composer Roger Neal, whose credits include the theme music of Mozart in the Jungle and librettist Neil Cohen, who is the creative genius behind the entire musical. 
And when I say genius, I really mean it. He is fantastic and his script and lyrics are brilliantly clever. Well, we interviewed him and we thoroughly enjoyed it. His episode was very popular and we agree with you. He is quite brilliant. I want to ask you a little bit of question about social media because you're pretty prolific on it. Would you say it benefits you as an opera singer? How does it work for you? I definitely think so. I made a lot of wonderful connections that I would not have made otherwise. I mean, this is how we connected. We connected Mm -hmm. through Instagram and it's how I connected with Neil. And yes, I wasn't even on Instagram until the pandemic. And I joined it in, uh, I joined Instagram in March, 2020 in order to have some professional visibility at a time when, of course, live performances were not taking place. And although I had been on Facebook, I had had a professional page on Facebook for the past few years, I was really shy about self-promotion. I did love to share posts that opera companies had made and to congratulate those companies and my colleagues on positive reviews, but I was exceedingly shy when it came to creating original self-promoting content. But of course, in this industry, I had to get over that to some extent. And I started to post on Facebook more often and joined Instagram. And then eventually, uh, a few months ago, took your advice to start posting on LinkedIn, which I hadn't previously done, even though I had had a LinkedIn account for, I suppose, about 10 years. Well, I like seeing you on LinkedIn. I like seeing you on all the social media because we can immediately listen to you sing, for one thing. What were you going to say? Well, you know, I, I had a question for you, Madison, as a performer and uh, a creative what would be your advice to someone that maybe is feeling just like you did where you feel a little uncomfortable about posting things about yourself what was there one thing that you just went hey i'm just gonna do it or is there any advice you can give on that line well performances of course are collaborative efforts and so thinking about things that way made me more comfortable because i wasn't posting only about myself. Mm -hmm. Posting about the production benefited the opera company, the directors of the company, the other singers, the instrumentalists, sharing information about these upcoming performances Mm -hmm. benefited everyone involved. And of course, audience members who were interested in attending these performances. So it was really just kind of reframing it for yourself and like make it a, more a story about what's going on in your life instead of just going, oh, I'm going to post about myself. I think that's what it sounds like you were doing. Yeah, it, plus she's, it help, she's helping the opera she's company, helping the, the opera musicians, companies. the venue, yeah. Yeah. hopefully packing a big audience. Hopefully, yeah. 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 That's so cool to, to hear that because I know a lot of people struggle with that. They're like, oh, I don't want to put myself out there and it's too, you know, self-promoting. It feels uncomfortable. But when you reframe it like you did. I think that was really a great idea. No, it definitely made me more comfortable with that. And I mean, I I loved performing and putting my voice out there. And yes, I did love publicity. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just not entirely comfortable about <laughs> creating my own original publicity. Right. No, understandably, because it is a little difficult sometimes yeah, but everybody, to do that. You know, we I all know. have to do it. I mean, that's just the way social media is. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's there. Because if you had to hand out handbills on the corner of mm-hmm. 5th and Main, it doesn't, it's not as effective. No, true. But, you know, since we're talking about self-promotion here a little bit, now would be a great time for you to share a little snippet of a performance that we can play on the podcast. So let us know what you're going to be sharing with us today, and uh, then we can listen. Absolutely. This is going to be a snippet of Un Altra Volta Ancor from Partenope by Handel. Okay, great. Well, we'll take a listen.
Now everyone can hear why we appreciate your talent so much. And thank you for going beyond the snippet. I think you gave us a really wonderful performance. Oh, thank you, Rob. That's very kind of you. Yeah, I think we're all get, you know, really enjoying hearing a little bit of opera, a little bit of conversation. So very cool. Now, I know when we talked last time, you mentioned that you are a mezzo soprano. What does that exactly mean? It means that I have a lower voice than a soprano. Mezzo soprano literally means medium soprano or middle soprano or half soprano. So yes, sopranos are, ha- are higher and mezzos are a bit lower. And as a mezzo, I get to sing a very wide variety of roles, male and female roles. As I mentioned earlier, I was recently singing Cinderella. Mm-hmm. And then I sang Julius Caesar as Neil Cohen. I mean, of course, his name keeps coming up because he's so brilliant. As he said, I went from Cinderella to Caesar. Uh-huh. That's so versatile. I love it, though. I remember For seeing you, the so post. much fun. Yeah. yeah, I remember seeing the post. So much fun. I wondered why you were dressed like a guy. <laughs> that happens in <laughs> operas, though. Yeah, I know it does. It goes both ways, it too. It does, it does. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> this is going to be kind of a more detailed question, I guess. Have you ever prepared for a performance and you felt your voice wasn't as good as it could be? And how did you solve that problem? Well, of course, that can be a problem when a singer is sick. And, okay, I'll get into (laughs) graphic singer detail or two. There is the issue of phlegm and how do we get it off. And, of course, the act of singing helps the chords to rid themselves of that gunk. Sorry for getting so graphic, but it is. No, (laughs) actually, you know what? That's a problem that we face when we have to do a podcast. Yeah, and then we're facing allergies. Especially if you have allergies. Yeah. Yeah, so. So I think it applies to a lot of people, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, the act of singing can help to clean the vocal cords and hydrating is very, very important. I also drink alkaline water in general, Mm -hmm. um, even when I'm in good health. Of course, when someone is sick and the larynx is swollen, that can be quite problematic. And a lot of singers take prednisone. Now, it it is not, and and first of all, disclaimer, I'm definitely not a medical professional. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is not at all expert medical advice. But it is not advisable at all to take steroids in order to sing through a vocal injury. However, if a singer is simply taking a steroid such as prednisone in order to reduce inflammation caused by illness Mm -hmm. in order to sing. That's all right if if a singer is careful. So yes, there are lots of ways and certainly there are homeopathic remedies, wellness formulas, et cetera, et cetera. And in general, just taking good care of one's own voice, whether one is healthy or one is ill. Mm Mm-hmm. We well, often sense, see though. you often see opera singers are always wearing a scarf around their neck, i.e. Pavarotti, right? Yeah. Yes. No, it's important to protect the the voice, the larynx, and yes, certain climates can uh, can be rather problematic if it's particularly cold or windy. It can be beneficial to wear a scarf, mm-hmm. and um, if one is in a particularly dry climate. It can be useful to use a, a humidifier or some sort of steamer. Well, that's all good tips. Thank yeah, you for should, that. <laughs> yeah, we should be doing it. Yeah, we should be doing some of those things, I think. Well, you know, when you're talking about singing opera, I always picture, and I'm sure a lot of people do too, when you're watching it, you're in very close proximity, especially if you're doing kind of a, I, I want to say a love scene, but that's not really. Or a duet. Or right? a duet. And you're so close to each other. And I know that you are singing loudly. And how do you deal with that challenge or are there other challenges that you deal with? Like, how do you deal with personalities as well within all that? Yeah. What if you hate the person you're yeah, singing with? What if you with? can't stand them? What do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that I've never had that experience. I'm grateful to have worked with a lot of very mm-hmm. nice colleagues. So I haven't had the experience of singing a love duet or any other duet with a colleague whom I have disliked. Mm-hmm. But of course, we have to make sure that our voices go well together, that neither person is overpowering the other, and that 
we can continue to watch the conductor, especially at key moments, even while our characters are connecting. And there are different conductors who have many different styles. Some conductors will say, I'll follow you. I'll have the orchestra follow what you're doing. So please don't make any concerted effort to look at me unless it's a key moment. And other conductors will want singers to keep their peripheral vision on them huh. pretty much the oh, whole that's time. that's interesting. That's very interesting. I think I know which pro- conductor is the most professional because you're acting. I mean, part of what you're doing on stage besides yeah, singing, you're exactly. actually a, 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 an actress or an actor. Yes, definitely. But it's really a great experience to work with different conductors who work in different ways. Yeah. I can see that. Opera still has a a following here in the United States, and actually it seems to be growing. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems like audiences are much larger in Europe. In fact, Angie and I have witnessed operas in Europe. They seem to have a greater appreciation for operatic works. Historically, do you think that's because many of the famous operas were written and performed there in Europe? That's a really great, great question, and it definitely made me think. I don't actually know the reason, although now that I think about it, there are definitely a lot of great contemporary operas that have been written here that are being performed here. So I don't know, maybe that does have something to do with it. Well, some operas are really famous, and and, and maybe this is not the right thing to say, but Bugs Bunny cartoons made some operas really famous. And, and actually, <laughs> actually, I think when I was a young, very young child, it made me want to listen to the whole opera because it was performed oh, so well. And then I go, well, it's so interesting. It's kind of exciting the way they're talking or singing. And I wanted to hear the opera. Wow. I wonder if oh, wow. that happened with a, a lot of kids where they went, oh, I want to hear the rest of that. I like that. <laughs> well, I think I think especially in my generation that in some cases that was your first real impression of classical music. So true. You heard it and you heard it in, or and people were using it in TV commercials, too. But that you wouldn't pay as much t- attention to when you're actually watching a cartoon character perform it. So true. The great, Absolutely. you know, the tragedy operas. Uh, <laughs> you, I got envisioning it now. That was a good answer. I hope more people tune into operas. There's an opera show every Sunday or Saturday, I think it is, from the Met. And it's really worth getting to know what opera is all about. And I hope if you're on social media, you'll check out Madison because you'll be able to actually hear her sing. So you're next. You know, the thing that I like that you just said, maybe this is more, quote, American, is that you're doing more contemporary operas here in America, and maybe they're doing more classic operas in Europe, which is kind of cool because these contemporary operas are new, fresh, exciting. Do you think that that is kind of a trend here in America to do more contemporary operas like you have? I definitely think so. There are a lot of brilliant opera companies that continue to present the most beloved operas and companies that are reviving lesser known operas that also deserve to be heard. And there are many opera companies that are producing these new works. And I'm very grateful to have had a lot of opportunities, especially over the course of the past two years or so, Mm -hmm. to work with composers on their new pieces, some operas, some songs, some song cycles. In fact, now in Albuquerque, I'll be singing in the world premiere of this opera by Nathan Felix. Mm -hmm. Nathan and I connected a few months ago, and I really, really love working with him. And actually, in this opera, I'll be singing a pants role, a male role, Hernán Cortés. I'm learning a bit of history, too. (laughs) That's so neat that you are able to do different roles like that as a woman. I think it, even playing a man, it's kind of cool. And I like that you called it a pants role. <laughs> That's really <laughs> cute. <laughs> you know, I since we're talking about contemporary music, do you sing contemporary music? And if when you do, what is it like for you? Is it such a big change in the way that you sing? And I'm not talking about contemporary opera. It's more like something you might hear on the radio. I do sing some classic musical theater pieces such as Over the Rainbow, Mm -hmm. but I sing them in my own operatic voice. I use the same technique, except that perhaps 
some of my vowels are a bit brighter, mm -hmm. but yes, I, I do love to sing some of those pieces as well, but I, I just sing them in my own way, which is more operatic. Okay. That's it. Your own style. That's cool. I would love to hear over the rainbow operetta in an operatic an opera, style. It would sound really Well, it would charming. sound different than what yeah. you're accustomed to hearing yeah. Judy sing. That's true. You know, I'm sure our listeners, and I know both Angie and I are enthralled by your dedication mm -hmm. to singing. And Madison, what motivates you and what would you tell others that want to be more creative in their own lives based on your experience? The thing that motivates me is the thing that first motivated me to become a, an opera singer. And it sounds overly simple, but I just love the music. I, I loved it in the first place when I heard it mm -hmm. as a very young child before I started to imitate opera singers um, very badly, I'm sure, although I, <laughs> I enjoyed doing it. And a love of the music is definitely what drives me. And now I also have the great privileges of working with wonderful colleagues, such as conductors and composers and other singers, as I've mentioned earlier. And I really love to bring the stories of my characters to life and to communicate with audiences. I think when you, when you study your part in an opera, I'm guessing here, you have to thoroughly understand what the opera is all about from the beginning to the end and read it and study it and see how your role fits in to the overall opera. Because operas can have lots of people on stage. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not just one person standing there singing. Absolutely. It's definitely a collaborative effort. I know Angie's going to go to our favorite question that's coming up. But before I let Angie ask that question, mm -hmm. how about Madison giving us another song for us and our listeners? Certainly. This is a snippet of The Heroes of Freedom by composer Garrett Brown and poet Armando Mayoset. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this very special piece after we hear the excerpt. Okay, perfect. Well, let's take a listen. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. Can you give us a little bit of details on what we just listened to? I would to? love to know the details. Yeah. And it was, as I could say, brilliant. 
loved hearing your voice. Thank you. Thank you both. The Heroes of Freedom is the latest piece that was composed as part of Voices of the Valiant, one of my musical collaborations with Gray Team. Gray Team is a Florida-based nonprofit that works to prevent suicides among veterans suffering from PTSD. I discovered the organization last year through Lexi Aversa, a longtime friend and colleague of mine who has a hugely generous heart and orchestrates about as many charitable events as humanly possible. And I really fell in love with Gray Team's work. They have technology that is truly astonishing, far beyond anything that I could ever have imagined, and many different ways in which to help veterans and active duty service members to heal from physical, mental, and emotional trauma. I'm sure that most of you who are listening are very, very busy people, but if you have a few spare moments at some point, I might encourage you to check out Gray Team's YouTube channel in order to hear Carrie and his colleagues describe the work of Gray Team much, 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 much better than I could do. In any case, Voices of the Valiant was my first musical collaboration with Gray Team. Veterans send their own poetry to Gray Team or to me, and we match each poem to a composer whose style is appropriate. And I then perform these pieces and I've recorded a couple of them, such as The Heroes of Freedom, of course. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And then also, Madison, uh, when you have a chance, give us the link for that, and I'll go ahead and put it into the show notes. So that way, if anyone is interested in looking for a great team and wants to know more info, they can go ahead and connect and, and check out the YouTube channel. You know, I remember Madison talking about this, we're seeing on social mm-hmm. media, and because I'm a veteran, I kind of delved into what these guys are right. doing and what they're doing and what you did with them. And that is is great. It's a great service to veterans of... Yeah, and it has PTSD. That's so important. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, I hate to end this, but... I know. I think we've come to the point where we ask our question about the park bench. And Madison, if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Well, if I could travel back in time and chat with one of the great vocal pedagogues of the past, such as Manuel Garcia II, I would actually ask to have a voice lesson with him. I call myself a technique hound, and I would love to find out what I could learn. Oh, what a great answer. I wonder what you would learn. Yeah, for sure. And I bet he would learn something from you too, though. Probably. (laughs) Uh, You're very kind. Thank you. So well, it, it's not often that we get to hear the inside story on singing opera. And we thank you, Madison, for being so open and so candid. It was just great talking to you. That's why we wanted to have you back on again. So true. You're always, always a charm to listen to. Yes. Thank you for sharing a little bit about your life as a creative in opera and singing for us today. And now's the time I let everyone know. If you'd like to know more about Madison Marie McIntosh, we will have links for her under the show guest tab on thoughtrowpodcast.com so everyone can learn more about her and please connect with her on social media and check out her website. And also, if you are in the area, Madison, why don't you share with us and everyone where you will be performing? I'll be singing the role of Hernán Cortés in the world premiere of La Malinche, Traitor Savior, by composer Nathan Felix at the Albuquerque Museum. Uh, By the time when this podcast airs, we will have just had our first performance, but there will be one more performance of this amazing new opera this coming Sunday, July 24th at 1 o'clock. Okay, and perfect. we have listeners in New Mexico, so I hope they hear this episode. I hope they episode. head on over, yeah, yeah, and see you. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for being with thank us, you so Madison. Much, Madison. Thank you very much, Rod and Ingy. It's always a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you for having me as your guest again as on this amazing podcast. Oh, well, thank you. Also, if you're enjoying our podcast... Both Rod and I would really appreciate you buying us a cup of coffee. Just go to thoughtrow.com, scroll down a bit, and you can find that link right on our website on the homepage. It's really easy to do, by the way. Yes, it is. And all the money we receive goes to our production costs. Yep. 
and primarily because we want to keep our show commercial free and we want to continue to bring you the best quality content with great guests. That's right. Thank you for listening to Thought Row Podcast. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a 